Okay, so we are going to do something today that is a little bit different from what we typically do in this group, um, but it's for a very important reason. Today we're going to talk about how to be an intellectually fulfilled Christian. And <clears throat> normally what we're doing in this group is talking about specific evidences for Christianity or arguments against Christianity and, and going through that process of wrestling with um, intellectual or academic challenges to the things that we believe. But today we are going to address the question that's more fundamental than that, which is why should we care about that? Um, and to start us off, we're going to go into a bit of a diatribe of uh, the history of uh, the last couple hundred years um, in the English-speaking world to get a bit of a background and understanding of the intellectual environment that we live in today and why it is the way that it is. Okay, so welcome to Ratio Christi. Um, how many of you guys have heard of Ratio Christi before you showed up today or you know, came to Impact or, or something like that? Okay, not many of you. So Ratio Christi is a national and in fact international organization of student groups like this that are kind of loosely affiliated. Um, but we have a purpose and a mission, which is to help students give philosophical, historical, and scientific uh, reasons for being a Christian. So this group is fundamentally about the life of the mind and answering hard questions and engaging with intellectual challenges um, in, a, in a, a kind of serious way, um, both for your personal edification, but also so that you can gain insight that you can then share with other people. Um, now, importantly, Ratio Christi is this magical far away thing that's in like Indiana, right? Um, an organization that we are associated with, but a lot of the stuff we produce here is uh, the product of our little group here at A&M. It doesn't necessarily relate to the national organization. Before we get started, I have four questions for you all. Um, feel free, I'm gonna kind of go through these each one at a time. If you answer yes, feel free to raise your hand. That will let me know, kind of feel the, the room a little bit, but pay attention to all of them and count how many you're answering yes or no to, because it's going to be important later. Okay, so first question. The Bible contains all spiritual truth necessary for salvation. Okay, pretty uniform hand raising, okay? Second question. The cross and the atonement of Christ are central doctrines of Christianity. Okay, pretty uniform hands again. Third question. Real Christians undergo, undergo some kind of conversion, um, whether uh, an experience or some kind of process, but you go through some conversion experience. I think pretty uniform hands again, maybe slightly less uniform. And lastly, Christians should be actively and publicly engaged in their faith, uh, in particular evangelism, but not limited to evangelism. Okay, again, sounds like everyone's pretty much on board there. Okay, we'll come back to that later. So, for a Christian, the most important consideration is not pragmatic results, when we're talking about knowledge, but rather the truth. So, we are interested in knowing true things. Um, learning matters, because the world matters. For a Christian, the most important reason for exercising the life of the mind is the implicit acknowledgement that things do not exist on their own. When we study something, we are learning about the one who made that thing. Everybody agree with that statement? So this is kind of our guiding principle for the rest of, uh, the rest of what we're going to do today. Now, Christianity has a long and rich intellectual tradition. Um, how many of you all have heard of Papias, or Irenaeus, or Origen, or Justin Martyr, or Thomas Aquinas, or Augustine, right? There are many, many people in a long line of tradition from those um, immediately after the apostles all the way through uh, to, the, to the Reformation of deep intellectual reflection. 
men and women who spent their entire lives devoted to understanding God and philosophy and how those things interact. So this is not something that is um, basically engaging in this life of the mind, the intellectual um, life, is not something that is new to Christianity. It's something that um, has always been important for a, uh, a, a minority of Christians, obviously, uh, but a very important minority of Christians. So we, we could talk about a lot of individual people, but I'm going to skip over that for the most part today. Um, just to point out, though, that this has been something that's been going on for a long time. Now, this did not end in, you know, 500 years ago in the Reformation. People like John Calvin and Martin Luther were very, very well studied of the church fathers, of people like Thomas Aquinas and Augustine and Anselm and, and the medievals. They engage in this same intellectual tr tradition and were interacting with it. So when Luther is writing um, about the ills of the Catholic Church, he's not doing that in a vacuum from kind of an individual position. He's referencing people like Thomas Aquinas and, and Augustine. Um, so even the Reformation, that is very much a break from tradition, is continuing that same intellectual tradition. Now, that is not to say that all of the Protestant groups that came out of the Reformation felt this way. If, has anybody ever studied a little bit about uh, the history of the Reformation and the groups after, that came out of the Reformation? So you probably are familiar with some groups of people that definitely weren't in, to, in that intellectual tradition um, that were very populist. And we'll talk about how things like that happened later as well. <clears throat> But this intellectual tradition continued all the way through to the Puritans. Who knows who the Puritans are? Who are, who are some Puritans that we know? <laughs> okay. John Bunyan. Hmm? Bunyan. Yeah. So obviously uh, people in Britain and uh, a particular group of them that came to North America um, in Massachusetts, right? Um, they did kill the witches, um, but they were among the most uh, fervent supporters of things like teaching children to read. You know, more than you know, 300 years ago, there was an entire colony of people in Massachusetts that had almost 100% rate of literacy compared to the very abysmal rates throughout most of the world because the Puritans believed that it was really important to be able to read the Bible in particular, but they also had a lot of respect for engaging in that uh, intellectual tradition that they had gained from their Protestant roots. Now, getting to the point a little bit, how did this come to us today? So the Puritans, that was a long time ago. And a lot has changed in our cognitive environments since the Puritans. Um, now, some key kind of touch points to keep track of as we're thinking about this. Uh, the first thing is the, great, uh, the First Great Awakening. Who's, who's heard of this? So the First Great Awakening is a, a very important uh, religious revival that happened in Britain and the United States. And in the U.S., Jonathan Edwards was one of the kind of main... Uh, beginners and promoters of, of the First Great Awakening. And this was in the early se uh, 1700s, so the 18th century. <coughs> then the American Revolution, obviously we all know when that was, right? And so that's pretty, pretty easy. But the, the revolution is a very important historical moment that significantly affects and interacts with what happens in Christian thought in North America. Because... We have all of a sudden an entire nation that is basically throwing all of tradition out the window, rebelling against you know, our political overlords. At the same time, they're rebelling against the religious authorities. And there's a significant uh, consequence of this kind of ethos in the way Christianity and Protestantism uh, continues in North America. At the time of the American Revolution, only 10% of the population of the 13 colonies held church membership. And given that that was like 
probably the majority of Massachusetts that did. You can think of the other colonies probably had a lot less, like down in the southern colonies. So we we'll, we think sometimes as America at the era of the founding being a uh, you know very Christian country, but that actually it wasn't until the Second Great Awakening, which happened really basically immediately post-revolution. The Second Great Awaken, Awakening is another great series of revivals, religious revivals uh, throughout um, largely you know, the United States at this point um, that set the stage for really the, the world that we live in today. Okay, so how does this really happen? So I said Jonathan Edwards, right? Jonathan Edwards, in many ways, was the first and the last great evangelical thinker from North America. So um, Jonathan Edwards was, although largely forgotten for, you know, 150 years, um, has been recognized at this point you know, in history as a, a, a very uh, prolific kind of ph philosophical theologian. Um, but he's... Uh, has a very good like intellectual legacy. Um, he did a lot of very creative and interesting thinking about how Christianity impacts things like science and uh, philosophy and how we should understand God and things like that. And important, John, importantly, Jonathan Edwards was engaged in all these different areas. He was not um, he was not just you know, in his cave writing about theology. He was writing about philosophy uh, and interacting with ideas from science um, and had a kind of full-orbed intellectual life that he was engaged in. Um, he was a product of the Enlightenment. Who knows what the Enlightenment is? Okay, so he was a product of the Enlightenment to, a, to an extent, but he was also a critic, and he, he denied the kind of con the, the ethos of the time that matter in motion was the foundation of reality and that um, pursuit of happiness was the, the primary goal of man. Who's ever heard that term, pursuit of happiness, right? Where does that come from? Yeah, right? So founding documents of the United States, right? Um, th this, this is, you know, a very much enlightenment ideal. <clears throat> Um, but Jonathan Edwards put God at the foundation and the center of his theology and his, his philosophy, uh, kind of counter to uh, the prevailing Enlightenment feelings. Now, unfortunately, though, he also was a champion of a way of doing things that ultimately led to him really having no intellectual successors. Uh, he was the first and the last kind of great uh, intellectual of his time. Um, so, yes, he promoted a program that led to the eclipse of the, of the evangelical mind in America. <clears throat> um, and mostly this was because he was the major figure in the First Great Awakening, which was a great religious revival, but it was very populist, so it was very focusing on um, individual people, and it was very much not focusing on the intellectual life and intellectual development, much more on uh, you know, this kind of revivalistic attitude. Now, around this time, really kind of uh, revolutionary time and, and, and post that, um, the United States, uh, North America, be was be being influenced by the Enlightenment. Um, but in North America, we didn't experience the Enlightenment. We experienced Enlightenments different stages of enlightenment from, that were being imported basically from different places. Um, so in America, uh, things like this more skeptical enlightenment, people like Voltaire and David Hume, uh, they didn't have much in influence here. Uh, the revolutionary enlightenment, Rousseau, Thomas Paine, um, although we have one pamphlet from Thomas Paine that is cited as being influential in the United States, overall they were not uh, that Long, long term, that influential in the way uh, thought developed. There was appreciation for the moderate Enlightenment, people like Isaac Newton and John Locke, but the part of the Enlightenment that really influenced North America 
um, has been termed the didactic enlightenment, uh, which is uh, largely from Scotland. So the Scottish enlightenment, uh, the, despite the fact that David Hume is, is from that group. Um, in particular, people like Thomas Reed and Ad Adam Smith. Um, you know, so philosophy and economics. <clears throat> now, the reason why this is relevant, um, obviously there are whole books that are written about these sorts of things, but there's one important thread that I think is, is important for us to talk about here, and that's this idea of common sense. So Thomas Reed was a philosopher from Scotland, and he had a particular um, uh, epistemological view, uh, common sense rationalism. Um, but br more broadly than that, the idea is that, um, and the idea that was imported from this into North America, yes, question, Sam? Is that an AI-generated fiction? It is, but it looks quite like him. <laughs> yes. Look up a picture of him and see if you agree. Um, Yeah, this one. Yes. Yeah, I could have colored it. I could have colored it and made it better. But. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the idea that was extracted from this is this idea of common sense. This was a, a theme throughout a lot of this portion of the Enlightenment, which is basically the idea that your mental faculties are such that you can use your just general common sense to address and, and answer important questions. And when we think about things, even today, think about, especially in you know, Christian, uh, kind of Christian bubble, how often do we appeal to common sense or plain readings of things um, as to why a particular view is correct? Um, so this has been a very influential view, um, especially in our, our kind of religious tradition in this country. Um, so importantly, uh, these views really came to dominate in the educational institutions in uh, the United States in the first half of the 19th century, uh, Yale, Harvard, Brown, Princeton, which at the time were all religious universities. And this uh, philosophic environment became the, st the standard kind of mode of communication. Now, um, because of this, this importation of these Enlightenment ideals, there's a, a set of preconceived notions that just became the fundamental uh, starting point of discourse in the United States. So these are things like trust and objectivity, you know, that you can objectively see something and, and come to a conclusion without biases. Um, Self-evident truths, unalienable rights. You heard those phrases before? Laws of nature, moral sense, scientific rationality, um, Baconian faith. So Francis Bacon, the creator of the scientific method. So how can you, you know, use the scientific method in understanding Christianity or, or, or participating in Christianity? And, and most importantly, common sense. Now, some of the other consequences of this um, were a little bit unexpected. Um, but a number of things began to emerge in specifically the more evangelical Protestant um, component of, of uh, America. Um, and one of these is revivalism. So we already talked about revivalism in the First Great Awakening, right? And this is what killed Jonathan Edwards' intellectual legacy. Um, and it was back in full force, strong again, in the Second Great Awakening after the Revolution. Um, and uh, to the point that um, one of the greatest evangelists of that early, early 19th century period, Charles Finney, has anybody ever heard of him, Charles Finney? Uh, he's still frequently cited today. Um, and he made this statement, the connection between the right use and means uh, for a revival and a revival is philosophically, i.e. scientifically, sure. That is, if you know the right process to go through for a revival, you are guaranteed to have a particular result, a very mechanistic approach. If you set up the right music and you have the right speakers and you have your chairs set up the right way and it's at the right time of year, you're guaranteed that people are going to respond to the altar call. Earlier you said uh, Jonathan Edwards had a very individualistic approach. This seems to be the opposite. 
Individualistic is the idea that you have, um, like as an individual, you are, like the individual is like the center, right? Um, when you are you know, deciding on what's true, it's you as an individual that's doing that. You're using your common sense. Um, this is more uh, referencing this idea that these enlightenment, 19th century and 18th century enlightenment ideals, that like everything is Newtonian physics. And if you just understand it, you can always be guaranteed of an outcome by just like setting things up the right way. Right? And so it's treating people like, you know, well, we can obviously create little Christians. We just follow this formula, you know, do it, we're good, right? <clears throat> Which is, I think we'd all agree, probably kind of a bizarre mindset today. Today. Absolutely it is, right? I mean, any church is always thinking about, okay, what do we have to do to make things work better, right? Um, but maybe with a little less, hopefully with a little less certainty this than this. But th this mindset is not gone. Like, this mindset still exists today, and that's part of the, the discussion that we're going to have. <coughs> Now, the view of the Bible was another important component of this as well. Um, at this time, the, the time of the Revolution, while basically all other tradition was being jettisoned, pro, uh, Protestants had largely already jettisoned uh, tradition at the time of the Second Great Awakening. Um, that is mostly Baptists. Um, so you're kind of jettisoning all of church tradition. You don't even have, you know, like high church Presbyterians or anything like that. Um, certainly no Anglicans or Episcopals. Um, despite jettisoning all of that, the one thing that wasn't jettisoned, for both good and ill, uh, was a very high view of the Bible. So that sola scriptura was the only, basically the only part of Christian tradition that was retained. Everything else was um, not so much questioned as just kind of forgotten and pretended like it didn't exist. But this, combined with some of these Enlightenment ideals, produced some weird results. Um, so here's one other comment. Uh, so the Bible very easily became a book dropped from the skies for all sorts of men to use in their own way. So the first half of the 19th century, basically in every part of discourse on any side of any issue, the Bible was going to be cited. And because the way you decide it, what the Bible means is by whatever makes sense to you, regardless of your preconceptions or level of education or how much you've thought about it, um, that was just the standard of discourse. So some other comments here. Theological arguments could claim a view was, quote, plainly at variance with the explicit decora declarations of Scripture and our unbiased biased feelings. In this case, they were referencing inheritable depravity, which is probably something that many of you would agree with, but it's at odds with the plain view of Scripture. Or at least he thought it was, but he was obviously arguing with people about that. Um, or another comment, the best uh, method of Bible study is pursued in the science of physics, regulated by the maxims of Bacon and Newton. So a very mechanistic, kind of materialistic view of what the Bible is and how to use it. Um, without kind of, you know, any, any nuance to understanding uh, how it was written or anything like that. And, and to be clear, we're talking not about liberal Protestantism. We're talking about evangelical Protestant, Protestantism, um, which was kind of the dominant view, <clears throat> at least for another 50 years. Now, this view, this view of the Bible, um, became accepted not only by the conservatives, but also by the liberals and non-Christians, and was adopted into higher critical views of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> so a very famous publication, I think this was in the UK, called es Essays and Reviews. It's a bunch of essays about the Bible, which is basically rejecting uh, traditional views of what the Bible says and what it teaches and whether it's true and things like that. Because they're accepting the same literalistic kind of wooden way of thinking about the Bible, but then they're saying, okay, this is what it means, but it contradicts with, you know, what we learn from archaeology or, or whatever. Um, so these things all started to kind of culminate in the late 19th century, so after the war. 
Um, so basically over the next several uh, decades, you know, after the Civil War, um, you start to see fractures in this. So um, evangelicals lose cultural prominence. So all of those universities, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, um, that all were religious, uh, eventually that, that came to pass. Um, no longer were clergy presidents of the universities, no longer were they um, you know, kind of bastions of conservative uh, theology. Um, they became kind of the secular institutions that we're used to today. Um, and it's, you know, there's lots of complicated reasons for this, but basically what had happened is that enlightenment view that treated all these things as presuppositions and presumed we could just reason from common sense alone had resulted in whole generations of Christians in North America being completely incapable of engaging intellectually with things like the new sciences at the new universities. So there just weren't people to fill places in science faculties of universities who were Christians. There, there was no Christian intellectual to, to make the universities, to fill them and to run them. Um, and obviously this was uh, very disconcerting to a lot of people. And uh, eventually we had a kind of split in, in uh, Protestantism, this so-called uh, fundamentalist modernist controversy um, which you can see really clearly illustrated in the Presbyterians, um, who you know lost control of uh, Princeton and then founded a new seminary uh, to, to for the you know the remnants of uh, th the theologically or orthodox you know theology faculty uh, to continue you know separately from Princeton Seminary. But again, what happened here is that. Fundamentally, the modernists and the fundamentalists agreed on this enlightenment view of the Bible. The modernists just said, okay, therefore the Bible's false. And the fundamentalist, fundamentalist said, okay, therefore, like all this newfangled science stuff is false. Mm -hmm. Would you say your fundamentalists kind of became more of what you would think of as like your conservative churches politically and modernists became more of what you think of as your liberal churches today? Yes, yeah. So basically you, you have... After the Civil War, conservative evangelicals that retain this old populist science, kind of Baconian, Newtonian science, um, which becomes increasingly outmoded, um, whereas the liberal evangelicals opt to you know, pursue this elite um, ivory tower science, which is um, you know, increasingly the only academically respectable option. <clears throat> but both of them do this by still retaining this reliance on common sense. This, uh, this 19th century enlightenment view. <clears throat> now, um, <coughs> yeah. So ultimately though, some very negative consequences arose from this situation. So, um, which in the book that much of this content comes from is referenced as the disaster of fundamentalism. Um, which we'll, we'll pull that back a little bit in a second. But basically, fundamentalism was a reaction, and, and to a great degree, a populist re reaction, although there were obviously more kind of intellectually engaged people involved as well, but largely a pop populist reaction against the changing nature of the United States. Um, the country was rapidly urbanizing, and so the environments that um, religious activity ordinarily happened in were changing rapidly. Um, uh, philosophically, naturalism was becoming a prevalent worldview. Um, there was a huge amount of Roman Catholic and Jewish immigration, as well as immigration of just non-religious people um, from Eastern Europe and from places like Ireland and Italy. Um, and so all of a sudden, the dominance of a huge proportion of the population being kind of evangelical Protestant was going away. Um, in the more intellectual spheres, the, the, the Bible was kind of dismissed as irrelevant, um, and there was rampant moral relativism. <clears throat> um, now, to be, sh to, to be clear, a lot of these things were very negative things that needed to be dealt with, but unfortunately, the way those things were dealt with um, also resulted in uh, a very strong anti-intellectualism, a rejection of uh, like higher education and learning, 
um, hardening of those commitments that had been formed in the 19th century. So in addition to trying to maintain theological orthodoxy, um, broadly, different fundamentalist groups also doubled down on other things that were not really part of Orthodox Christianity, uh, or not essentials, um, and became very entrenched in those views, which is something we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about more later, um, and had a theological emphasis that ultimately disincentivized deep thinking about Christian issues. Some of the things that came out of the, the fundamentalist uh, uh, era that you might be familiar with, holiness, spirituality, Pentecostalism, and premillennial dispensationalism. Anybody uh, a dispensationalist or go to a dispensationalist church? I know the answer is yes, because I'm sure there's probably people here that go to my church. So who, anybody go to Grace Bible Church? Okay, dispensationalist. Uh, anybody? Hmm? So uh, do you know what premillennial, premillennial, millennialism means? That means that uh, there will be a, um, or sorry, uh, they're, they're like the rapture. Tribulation. Tribulation and rapture. Everybody know that stuff? Yeah. Okay, that came from this era. So, um, and specifically that those will come before a thousand years. Yes, of Christ. Christ. Pre-millennial rapture. The dispensationalist uh, tribulation. Like Dispensational is just like a broad theological category of a, a way of thinking about theology that God gives grace in these, through these different dispensations in time. And there's Israel, and then there's the church, um, which is not really that important. Actually, finding a definition for dispensationalism is very difficult because it's a very nebulous, ill-defined uh, term. Yeah, in, in one of the books I have, it has a nice little paragraph about it. If I can remember where it is, I'll give it to you. <laughs> um, but the point is, these are the things that came out of uh, fundamentalism. Uh, but importantly, there was no fundamentalist philosophy or history of science or aesthetics or history or novels or poetry or juris jurisprudence or literary criticism or sociology or at least none that were um, really known by anyone who is outside of their bubbles. Um, so it was kind of an intellectual dead end. There were no, no culture was produced by this. No Christian society was produced by it. But uh, there were some very important positive things that were retained, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, in the early 20th century, um, there was a change. So at the time of the fundamentalist modernist controversy, you have basically anybody who wants to be theologically orthodox has to be fundamentalist. Um, and then you have the more liberals, right? Um, but in the 20th century, more and more people became uh, worried or uncomfortable about the fundamentalist label uh, and the inherent anti-intellectualism. And so people split off from this group into what today we call evangelicals um, uh, and what the fundamentalists sometimes term neo-evangelicals uh, in the, the first part of the first half of the 20th century. So, um, and this is basically what we have today. I mean, that was... Ultimately, you know, Billy Graham, right? Billy Graham basically created what we call evangelicalism. Now, only just for the sake of uh, kind of uh, relating to this label of evangelicalism, I want to know who in here considers themselves an evangelical? So a good number of you. Who in here is a little bit like concerned sometimes about the label of evangelical? because of other connotations? Okay, yeah, so a real thing. Uh, one definition of evangelical that's used in history research is this right here, these four things. So how many of you guys answered yes to all four of those questions? So by this definition, you're an evangelical. Even if maybe uh, you're not like a fan of you know, Donald Trump or something like that, right? That's actually not what makes you an evangelical, believe it or not. Um, okay. So now, we just threw a bunch of shade on uh, fundamentalists and to an extent some of the evangelicals that uh, kind of bear some of the, the results of this still to this day. But that's not really fair because, again, if you wanted to be theologically orthodox for 100 years, you, know, you had to fall into these, these groups. So despite the anti-intellectualism, fundamentalism and then evangelicalism has retained um, 
the supernatural view of, uh, of Christianity. It's retained um, you know, core orthodox theologies. Um, <clears throat> and you know, has given probably all of us, we, we bear positive results from some of these, uh, some of these things. But we also have some kind of uh, societal baggage because of this. And some of the views that we hold might be still strongly the result of some of these historical accidents, um, more so than what we think of as actual Christianity. Now, okay, so that's it for the history. And now we're going to talk a little bit more positively. So you want to be an intellectually fulfilled Christian. What does that mean? How do we escape some of our own traditions, anti-intellectualism, that we will randomly get hit at. If you want to be a, uh, an intellectually active Christian, you are going to come up multiple times in your life against situations where people tell you that you shouldn't do that because there, there's going to be somebody. So how do you think about this process? So um, another book that I use to put this together is a, a really good book called um, Jesus Christ and the Life of the Mind. I have a slide at the end that, that'll show it to you guys. Um, which basically is a very short book that just um, says, okay, let's talk about Jesus and understanding a little bit about Jesus. What does that mean about the way we should think about thinking? So, first thing, what's the first thing that you know about Jesus from the Gospel of John? Anybody quote the first few verses? Yeah. Yeah. He was the Word. Yeah, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? But what else? Through him all things were made. Nothing, that was made, or nothing was made that has been made. And then the Word became flesh. Now reflect on this a little bit. Because this is pretty profound. God himself became a material being that inhabited our physical world. And he was also the one who created it. Everything we see in the natural world, everything we see in human societies, literally everything we see in the world is the product of Christ. He created it. So is there anything that in the world that you can study or think about that is off limits? Think about that. Everything you can think about in the natural world, you are studying the works of Christ. So if you have this perspective, you have permission to think about things. Right? If it was worth God doing, isn't it worth you thinking about why he did it or how he did it? Right? And because... God became flesh. You know, the material world obviously is not so bad. So there's a, there's a tendency sometimes to think of uh, the, the material physical world as evil and, you know, we die and become spiritual someday and leave materiality behind. But that's not true. That's not the view of, um, of the Christian scriptures. The material world is what we are meant to inhabit. This is what God has created us uh, to live in. And in eternity, we will continue to inhabit a material, spatio-temporal space. We aren't going to be disembodied souls, right? Mm -hmm. So, thinking about it in that way, would that mean that... Sometimes I think about this, where it's like... God created the ability to sin. Did he also have the intention of us not sinning in the first place or knowing... I don't know, I kind of go back and forth between that because a lot of people that I talk to will, anytime that sin is brought up, it's just directly, oh, that's the devil. That's got to be the devil and stuff. And like bridging that gap between if all things you can think about are of God, does that mean that all things that stray away from God, i.e. sin, is that also of God? Did he create the... I mean, so, so sin is not... Uh, you know, sin is a state of affairs in the natural world, right? Like it's a thing that somebody has done or a mental state. A mental state can be sin also. Um, <clears throat> but that's not, you can study sin, right? 
You want to study why somebody steals, that's something you can study and understand why, right? And there, as a Christian, there might be very good reasons why you would want to do that. Now, you shouldn't engage in sin, right? Um, so if you can't study it without engaging in sin, that's probably a problem. Um, <coughs> but um, the question of uh, the relationship between sin and evil and God's sovereignty is probably a rabbit hole we shouldn't go down to. But if anybody wants to talk about some, uh, uh, you know, like Calvinism and Molinism and Arminianism afterwards, uh, when we go downstairs, I'm definitely up for that. We're on the first floor. Huh? We're on the first floor. Well, are we going to basement? <laughs> we'll figure it out. But yeah, it's so. Um, to answer your question, though, it is it is a whole a whole long discussion actually to address to address that specific question, um, which we do do sometimes. Sometimes we actually do that as a whole topic in here, um, but it's not a quick answer, or an answer that everyone will agree with. <laughs> Um, so here's another quote from one of my favorite people, N.T. Wright. Um, there is no sphere of existence over which Jesus is not sovereign. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. <coughs> the logic of this message requires that those who announce it should be seeking to bring Christ's lordship to bear on every area of human and worldly existence. So again, every aspect of, of, of human reality should be subject to Christ's lordship. Which implies that you have to actually engage in that aspect of human reality. One of the chapters in this book uh, is entitled The Atonement as a Principle of Scholarship, um, which is, again, thinking about reflecting on the atoning work uh, work of Christ and what does that mean for thinking about different uh, disciplines. and I'm just going to reference this briefly, but a food for thought for you guys to think about. Um, thinking about the propitiation, redemption, justification, and reconciliation uh, that are part of the atonement. What are the consequences of that? What do what some of those things mean? The fact that humans are sinful and that God has to do you know, something rather significant to address that, but that he's actually willing to do that for humans? There's a lot of significance baked into uh, what we think of as the atonement um, that has a lot of consequences if you think about it consistently with the way you think about other aspects of the world. But we're not going to dwell on that because we are coming to the end of our time. So, last comment here. We're going to talk about intellectual virtues really briefly. So who's heard of virtue before? Who knows what some of the like medieval virtues, like the scholastic virtues are? Or uh, really, they're, Arist- they're Aristotle's, right? He may have even stolen from Plato, I think. Huh? That, well, that's a theological virtue, but okay. Faith, faith chastity, temperance, courage, courage piety. piety. Well, maybe if you're a Stoic, but probably not if you're not a Stoic. So... Humility. These are the, the, the character traits that you want to develop to become a good person. Developing these, um, a good person is the person that possesses virtues, right? Now, there are also intellectual virtues. Um, and importantly, Christianity lays a foundation for the intellectual life that does not exist in secular, uh, secular modes of thinking. So some of these things are what we already talked about. Christ is creator. Also things like the noetic effects of sin, which maybe we'll talk about here in a minute, right? The, the fact that sin darkens your mind, right? Like that we are, we are fallen, we, we don't have perfect common sense. Um, many biblical commands about how we should think about things. <coughs> um, and Christians can be confident in employing, in employing their intellectual gifts Uh, intellect as a gift from God. Now, some of these intellectual virtues are curiosity, attentiveness, uh, intellectual humility, open-mindedness, intellectual tenacity, and uncertainty. Um, So, one of the marks of a non-intellectually virtuous person is someone who is always certain about everything. 
because you probably aren't justified in being certain about many of the things you believe. doesn't mean you shouldn't believe them. It just means that there's not really good reason for you to be certain. Um, but instead of talking about these individually, I want to give you guys just a few examples of uh, basically what not to do. Uh, things that are negative examples of developing intellectual virtues. Um, so first of these, like I just referenced, being overly certain. So here's another nice quote. Uh, when someone is honestly 55% right, that's very good and there's no use wrangling. If someone is 60% right, it's wonderful. Um, praise God. Uh, but what if somebody says they are 75% right? Wise people say this is suspicious. What about 100% right? Whoever says he's 100% right is a fanatic, a thug, and the worst kind of rascal. Um, so being 100% certain all the time is not an intellectual virtue because you are, um, you are trying to attain, or you are basically uh, proposing that you are certain about something which you ought not be certain about. And it's okay to not be certain about things. Um, probably you shouldn't really be certain about most of the things that you believe. You can believe them. You can be 80% sure, but you, that does not mean you should be certain. You should also not be an ideologue. Um, so an ideologue uh, you ha is a person who has devotion to one central idea that excludes any ability to see potential flaws or any reasonable objections to it. The ideologue is a plague on intellectual life the search for truth ends because it has been found and bound. The mind of the ideologue is now locked tight, guarding the truth from creeping doubt, from being assailed by any alternatives that would even call part of it into question. So this is related to that certainty. Um, but a big part of this is, is not actually being certain, right? Being so afraid of doubting about something that you are unwilling to even consider that there's possibly a counter argument to your opponent's position. So if you ever believe something so strongly that you are convinced that no one could ever produce an argument that is even worth considering against you, you are not exhibiting intellectual virtue because uh, probably you are not so smart that you should be that certain that you could never be wrong and that no one else could have anything worse or worth contributing to your thoughts. And lastly, uh, of these, uh, don't be individualistic. So this is a really, really tough one in our uh, like kind of general society, but also in our uh, most of many of our religious communities, um, which is that whether you're doing scholarship, some of you are, are going to become scholars. You're here at a university studying for that purpose. Um, or you're just engaging in uh, everyday Christianity. These are things that are done in communities of people. It's not you and your Bible under a tree trying to understand God. You're not going to get very far. Literally millions and billions of people have spent their entire lives doing that same thing. And if you're smart... You will engage in that community to gain wisdom from all the other people that have, uh, that have thought about things and who don't have the same biases as you. This is the same thing with science. Um, yeah, or really any, any realm of human thought, science, history, philosophy, you know, the, um, any, any time where people are challenged to think hard about something and come to conclusions, it's not something that you can do alone. You can't just read a news article um, about something on Facebook and now think that you know enough to, to like judge a field of, of history, right? There's, uh, there's a whole community of people that have devoted their lives to thinking hard about those questions. And if you want to really know, you got to engage with those people, which is hard because there is a lot of knowledge in the world and you will never scratch the surface of what all the people in the world engage in in all these fields. But that's part of having intellectual humility is recognizing that. And knowing that you actually, you actually can't even be a novice in most fields of human thought. You can only choose to be a novice in a few things and be completely ignorant of most, most of human thought. Because we just don't have time. <laughs>
So the Christian community in particular, when we're talking about understanding Christianity and Christian theology, is very diverse. Most of us have never engaged with a tradition outside of our very nar- narrow uh, denomination as it has existed just you know, in the last decade. But Christianity has a long history. There are 2,000 years of people engaging in thinking about the Christian scriptures and Christian theology. So we really need to engage in that broader community so that we can understand and, and gain from those sorts of wisdoms. Um, so have, when you're thinking about theology, have you thought about the church fathers? Have you thought about the medievals? Have you thought about the Africans or the Chinese believers? You realize that there are more evangelical Protestants in Africa and China than there are in the United States by like a factor of three or four, right? Like we think of ourselves as the center of the world, but we're really not anymore. And we're not growing really either anymore. So we're about to be the footnote um, in the history of Christianity. Um, what about the Anglicans? What about the Orthodox, et cetera, et cetera? There's a lot out there. Uh, part of having uh, some of those intellectual virtues is learning to navigate that and how to think about uh, where you actually fit into that picture. And this is a big part of what we're going to be doing this semester um, in Ratio Christi, um, which basically comes up to our last uh, few things here. So, takeaways for today. Um, there's a rich history of intellectual, deep intellectual engagement in Christianity. It's been going on for thousands of years, and it will continue for um, thousands of years further, you know, barring the return of Christ. Um, fundamentalism has had a significant effect on the way we, in our particular context of North America, English-speaking, white, evangelical Protestants. Uh, those same issues don't necessarily exist in all other branches of Christianity, especially across time and geography. Um, Christianity has the resources to support rigorous, intellectually um, fulfilled faith. And you don't have to be worried about reading a book and becoming an atheist. Because whatever is in that book, it's about something that Christ made. Um, And it will take a lifetime, but you can develop intellectual virtues that will enable you to effectively engage intellectually with the world around you, um, with other Christians, and with non-believers.